Hi, my name is Cynthia Rudin, and I lead the Prediction Analysis Lab, whose focus is on interpretable machine learning. So why do we care about interpretable machine learning, and what is it? Um, well, we care because a lot of bad stuff is happening right now. There are bad bail and parole decisions being made based on proprietary black box models, and there uh, are, have been cases where machine learning models are paying attention to words in an image rather than the medical content. Um, there are cases where uh, your loan is being denied and you have no idea why. And uh, I claim that black box machine learning perpetuates this problem. Now, a black box machine learning model is a formula that's either too complicated for any human to understand or it's proprietary, which means that it's some company's secret sauce and we have no idea how complicated the model actually is. Whereas an interpretable machine learning model obeys a domain-specific set of constraints so that humans can better understand it. So these are models that are constrained. They're, it's constrained optimization. Is, that's the name of the, the, the game. Now, why do we need these models? Well, for anything high stakes, anything where you really care about what the model is doing. So I've listed a bunch here, credit, criminal justice models, credit scoring models, air pollution models, airplane maintenance, and lots and lots of healthcare applications where you really don't want anything to go wrong. So you really want to understand what your model is doing. Now, the interesting thing about the idea of using interpretable models is that a lot of people think that there must be a trade-off. Like either it's really accurate and you can't understand it, or it's not so accurate and you can understand it. But that actually isn't supported by scientific evidence. In fact, um, for every domain that I know of, we've been able to come up with interpretable machine learning models that are just as accurate as the black box models. And in fact, interpretability actually leads to more accuracy. When you actually understand what you're doing, you can do a better job making decisions. So there's a little bit of nuance to that. Um, so let me tell you about that. So there's really two different kinds of problems, um, and they behave very differently. So there's uh, problems involving tabular data, which is where all the features are interpretable. So that's most of the kind of interesting problems that I just talked about, so criminal justice, healthcare, and so on. Um, as opposed to sort of raw data where the features themselves are uninterpretable. So tabular data kind of looks like this, where raw data kind of looks like that. It's like, you know, maybe images where one pixel really doesn't tell you anything about the, the outcome. Or sound waves or very large text, bodies of text, right? So these two types of uh, data behave very differently with respect to machine learning models. For raw data, neural networks is the only technique that's working right now, whereas for tabular data, as long as you're willing to do some pre-processing of the data, all the methods have similar performance, which is amazing, because it means that as long as you optimize for uh, interpretability, then you can get things like very, very sparse models that are the same accuracy as your favorite neural network or your favorite whatever other complicated machine learning model you care about. And so this is a huge opportunity because if you're an optimization expert, you can actually optimize for interpretability as well as accuracy and get models that are really sparse but also really accurate. Um, so that really provides like a huge advantage uh, or a huge opportunity for people who want to work in, um, work in machine learning, um, especially for tabular data. So here's an example of the kind of models that my lab constructs. Um, we have a long, long-term project on optimal sparse decision trees. Um, so this is an example of a decision tree where you follow the conditions, like it's a logical model. So if prior offenses is not greater than three and age is you know, uh, not less than 26, you go to the left, right? Predict no arrest, okay? So you'd, you'd think that producing models this simple um, the simple looking would be easy, but it's not. In fact, um, producing models like this is computationally really hard. Uh, this problem of how to produce you know, optimal sparse trees, so trees like this that are like, optimized for, for their size as well as for their accuracy, that problem's been studied since the beginning of AI. And it's only sort of now, like in the last year or so, that we've been able to really construct these kinds of optimal trees for practical problems. Um, so for trees, the search space increases factorially in the number of variables, and there's no easy way to get uh, an optimal sparse tree. So to produce these things, um, we designed a series of theorems that um, reduce the size of the search space. And we're also very careful about how we organize our data in, in the computer's memory so that we can search the space really fast.
Now, scoring systems uh, is another important problem. It's been around for 100 years. And only in the last few years are, have we been able to produce optimal scoring systems. So a scoring system is a linear model that's sparse and has integer coefficients. Like here, the coefficients are 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, and 2. Um, now, again, this looks deceivingly easy to construct, right? But it's, it's not. Um, the search space is huge, and it's, it's discrete. So our solution to this problem is a cunning plane algorithm that uses branch and bound methods. And the thing I love about these two problems um, is that the mathematics and optimization work behind them are so complex and, and really elegant, and the solutions are so small and so beautiful, but also really practical. Like the model on the right here, that's actually used in intensive care units of hospitals, um, and it, it, you know, it, it's, it's in use every day in hospitals to help save lives and reduce brain damage for critically ill patients in the intensive care unit of hospitals. And this model was developed with neurologists. Um, so my lab members can say that they're some of the very, very few machine learning researchers whose work is used in very high stakes uh, settings. So let's talk about uh, raw data too, because um, as I mentioned, uh, there's no, th there's no uh, uh, loss in accuracy when you want to build an interpretable model, even in the raw data case, but you have to be able to define interpretability carefully. So we've been designing some new approaches to interpretable neural networks that allow the user to understand the reasoning processes behind uh, the predictions for these neural networks. And we have kind of two, two types of approaches. One is case-based reasoning, and the other is uh, neural disentanglement. So for case-based reasoning, case-based reasoning is where you reason about uh, a new case in terms of its relationship to past cases that you, that you know about, that you know the answer to. So for instance, here this is a bird watching data set, and the neural network is explaining to me that it thinks this bird is classified as a clay-colored sparrow because this, each part of the bird looks like another part of a prototypical clay-colored sparrow. And it's showing me all the comparisons it's making to try to explain to me its reasoning process for why this bird looks like these prototypes. Um, and so, in this paper that we uh, wrote to, to explain this case-based reasoning um, uh, idea for neural networks, it's actually, um, it's actually really simple. Um, you, you take the neural, your black box neural network and you add a layer to it. And it's a, a prototype layer that forces the network to do case-based reasoning, compare each image with the prototypes. And the prototypes are learned during training. The whole thing, everything is learned during training. Um, and so it's, it's nice because it actually explains to you, okay, well, this is why I think this, this is a clay colored sparrow, because it looks like this, and it looks like that, and it looks like this. Um, now, we're also doing work on neural disentanglement. Neural disentanglement is the idea of trying to get the latent space to disentangle itself so that, uh, that, different, that, that you understand when you move around in that latent space what's actually going on. So here, our goal was to try to get the concepts, um, so actual real, honest-goodness, understandable concepts to be along the axes of the neural network's latent space. Um, so just to give you a little bit more sense of this project, um, CNN's uh, convolutional neural networks are not naturally disentangled, right? They don't really have like an airplane node, a car node, a dog node. You'd love it if that was true, but really the airplane information is, goes all through the network. It doesn't concentrate in one spot. Um, so what people have been trying to do is they've been trying to uh, figure out where, you know, which neurons are activating when an airplane shows up and, and figure out, uh, you know, you're, they're creating a vector in the latent space that represents the activation of these neurons when that happens. And so if you take a batch norm layer of the network and you plot, um, you know, where the concepts are, plot the vectors toward those concepts, um, you can end up with a situation where you have two concepts that um, have the same concept vector, even though they're completely different. Like you have bridges and cars both off in the same direction. So that's actually not good. Um, so we designed this uh, technique that would whiten uh, the space, like make it like white noise. Um, and so when you add this concept whitening module, the latent space becomes whitened, so decorrelated and normalized, like white noise. 
And the axes of the latent space um, become aligned with the concept of interest. And so you have like neuron one is the airplane. <laughs> That's like the airplane axis and neuron two, um, its axis represents like cars or something like that. And so you, you actually, um, you actually then, you know, make the space disentangled. And so if you look along the axes, like if you look at the furthest point along the, ac the airplane axis, what you see is airplanes. And when you look along the bed axis in the latent space, what you see is bed. It's really, it's really cool. Um, and so, yeah, it's kind of like it's kind of like a principal component analysis for neural networks, if you want to think about it that way. It's a lot of uh, nice, uh, nice uh, linear algebra trickery by my students. All right, so I've talked about a couple of the projects that are going on in my lab: um, scoring systems and decision trees, and then interpretable neural networks. We have sort of three other areas that we work in, um, dimension reduction and data visualization, almost exact matching for causal inference, and as well as um, a theoretical project on understanding the set of good models and the importance of variables. Um, I'll just tell you a little bit about uh, dimension reduction quickly. So the idea of dimension reduction is that you, you want to take a high dimensional data set and reduce it to like two or three dimensions without losing accuracy. So here I want to take this mammoth data set which is a three-dimensional data set, and I want to project it down to two dimensions. So I want to like, you know, crush the mammoth like a leaf onto the page. And um, we use kind of the leading methods in dimension reduction to do this. Um, one of them is called TS&E, um, where TS&E unfortunately mangled the poor mammoth that looks like it was kind of like run over by a tank. Um, and then this is another very popular algorithm, UMAP, which again didn't really do much to the do much to the mammoth that the mammoth, it's not very flattering, let's just say that, for the mammoth. Um, here's another one, and uh, this is a more recent method, um, but this one still kind of loses accuracy in like the toes, and um, just, it's still, it's got the global structure, but it's kind of missing some of the small stuff, whereas our method actually captured really the, the toes and, and all, all kinds of stuff like that. So this is the, the method that my students are, are working on. Anyway, so um, one nice thing about working in um, interpretable machine learning is that uh, you get to you get to apply it in real domains and actually, you know, either help people or make scientific discoveries. And so I actually have collaborators in a lot of different uh, subjects where we're actually applying these methods to try to make a difference in the world. Um, so I have collaborators who are material scientists, neurologists, um, biologists radiation physicists or medical physicists and radiologists, as well as um, I have collaborators who work in causal inference and databases, and also, you know, other computer scientists. It's fun to work with computer scientists, too. Anyway, uh, so what I like about this job is that, you know, you, you can do a lot of very uh, interesting, beautiful mathematics, and it leads to elegant, interpretable models, but also those models can be used in practice to have impact in high stakes decisions. So I like that combination of, you know, today you prove a theorem and hopefully that theorem will have a major impact on, on someone's life. Um, I love the fact that, you know, when you're a statistician or machine learning scientist, you can play in everyone's backyard. You, work, you can work with everybody. And also, um, I happen to be in a particularly friendly department, which makes my life nice. Anyway, Thank you very much.